Despite many of the Germans engaging in attempted random raids and failed sabotage, one German officer was actually carrying out Vorbrick's wishes of gathering intelligence. Lieutenant von Oppen of the 13th Feldkompanie Schutztrupp had set out from Himo and was finding a path for future operations in the Imzima Springs area. Unlike his peers, he didn't try to single-handedly bomb the Ugun Railroad with a small party, but he and his men weren't alone. Lieutenant H.H. H. Davies' Abyssinian Company of the 3rd King's African Rifles had been commanding a party of mounted infantry sweeping the Mzima Springs area for German activity, guided by a party of Maasai scouts. They had been on patrol for a week and were moving through the difficult terrain when Von Open laid an ambush. Firing through the grass, Davies' men were caught off guard. Not knowing where the shooting was coming from, the British mounted soldiers and their guides withdrew. Lieutenant Von Open was able to withdraw as well. While the attack didn't make the British leave the area, it was deemed untenable due to the litany of factors. The thick thornbrush wore the forces down over time. Testy flies were rampant among the mounts being used by the British. Thirdly, the Maasai guides wanted to retire back to their homes, seeing the British retreat from a German attack. For the remainder of the campaign, the Maasai would support sides with guides, porters, with selling materials, and Vorbrick recalls an English Maasai say, it is all the same to us whether the English or the Germans are our masters. Despite falling back, the British African Distinguished Conduct Medal was awarded to Gazao Waldi Miram, having already earned the award in the pre-war era. His award was given a bar. The defense of the area was rearranged to be taken up by B Company of the First King's African Rifles, under Lieutenant R.C. Hardingham, building a post at Marabu and patrolling the Mzima area. Reporting back that the British forces were sparse and quick to flight, Lieutenant von Open, unlike his peers, completed his mission. With his intelligence, the next thrust was planned on the 3rd of September. 13th Feldkompanie's commanding officer, Hauptmann Schultz, took a column of the 1st and 13th Feldkompanie, a force of around 220 men and four heavy machine guns, to attack the Tesevo River Bridge of the Ugandan Railroad. On the 31st of August, Lieutenant von Open reported back to Himo, asking for reinforcements and a machine gun. Having just driven off a British mountain contingent, he felt a force could hit the Ugandan Railroad. A discussion between Major Kraut, Captain Schultz, and Lieutenant Open to carry out the attack after Warbrick's order was made. Two additional machine guns from the 1st Feld Company and Captain Schultz would lead the column with 13th Feld Company. Departing the next day, the 1st of September, to hit the Ugandan Railroad. This move was reported to British Nairobi by local agents. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Hardingham's section from B Company of the 1st King's African Rifles had taken over Lieutenant Davies' mounted patrol of the Mzima Springs area. The area was crisscrossed with water features and thick with prickly brush thorn bushes. He and his 24 men had built a camp on the 29th or the 30th of August which was built north of where Old Turish and Tesevo rivers meet. A good vantage point, as the brush is less overgrown, several native kraals, a kraal is an African livestock enclosure, were next to the Old Turish River, and to the north is a large hill. Schultz's column, having struggled through the thorn brush on the morning of the 3rd of September, decided to follow the river. Hardingham's pickets were now able to see the incoming German column. Schultz gathered his column on the river, gave precious time for Hardingham to concentrate his men, prepare for a fighting withdrawal, and send a runner to Tesevo. The German column, after receiving fire, had to stop to deploy his four heavy machine guns, forcing Hardingham's blocking section to retire. Hardingham continued to delay Schultz's column for the entire duration of its advance. Schultz, when contact was made, would halt his column, deploy his superior firepower, and did not squander the lives of his African troops. But refusing to charge and scatter Hardingham's forces into the bush bought valuable time for the British to organize and deploy troops to intercept Schultz's column. Hardingham's runner arrived on the evening on the 4th to Sasavo. The information was immediately relayed to the new area commander, Major A.A. A. James of the 29th Punjabis. Major James had arrived on the 1st of September, and had only been in command of the area for two days. He immediately ordered his two companies of the 29th Punjabis with a naval deck gun artillery piece under Captain Skinner and Captain Poninger from Voy to Tesevo, and the King's African Rifles at Maktao Bara Imtito Andi to send forces to pincer the German column. 
At 8.20 a.m., another runner arrived to Tesevo to report Harningham had stalled the German column 15 miles away from Tesevo. At 10 a.m., another runner was sent to report the Germans were 10 miles away. In that time, the following British units were deployed and made contact with Schultz's column on the 6th of September. Tesevo, with Major A.A. A. James, bringing units of the 29th Punjabis and King's African Rifles and a naval artillery piece. At Moktau, the 3rd King's African Rifles Mounted Infantry Detachment Lieutenant Davies, 20 men. At Burra, a mixed unit under Captain Saunders of 139 men. In Tito Andi, B Company, 4th King's African Rifles, Lieutenant Oldenfield, 110 men. And Nairobi sent A Company, 4th King's African Rifles, Lieutenant Foster, 125 men. Both Schultz and Hardingham would continue to exchange fire. The sources don't give any casualties for this day of fighting, but on the 6th of September, British Indian troops would see their first action in East Africa. Having stalled Schultz's column, Lieutenant Hardingham's section on the afternoon of the 5th of September rendezvoused with a detachment of two companies of the 29th Punjabis and 85 men of the 1st and 3rd King's African Rifles under Skinner. Hardingham reported to Skinner that the Germans were around 200 men and had four machine guns. Captain Skinner, less than 10 miles from Tosavo, thought it best to advance back the way Hardingham had retreated from. For the remaining afternoon and evening, Captain Skinner's column attempted to make contact with Schultz. When after marching five miles, now 15 miles away from Tosavo, Skinner sent a runner back to Major James, reporting the Germans had slipped past him. While they had been in the thick thornbrush, actually they had been right next to one another, in column. When a response arrived back, Major James ordered Skinner to fall back to Tosevo and attack the German column in the rear. Five miles from Tosevo, Major James had deployed another company of the 29th Punjabis, some additional King's African Rifles, and a naval artillery piece awaiting the Germans. Forces of the King's African Rifles were approaching from the north and south. In essence, Major James had effectively on paper boxed in the German column. Before the encirclement could be completed, five miles from Major James's line, Schultz's column hit Skinner's men in the rear. In the ensuing confusion, the African brush was the clear winner. As Skinner and his men exchanged fire, at midday at 12.50, two runners reached Major James to report his position. Dispatched at 12.45, five minutes before shots were exchanged, Major James rushed his units in all sorts of positions and directions to surround the German column. What truly happened was a maelstrom of confusion thanks to the thick brush. Skinner's firing line was reinforced by a section led by Lieutenant Oldenfield's B Company of the 4th King's African Rifles. Major James had heliographed messaged Oldenfield to send his company forward to cut down the German forces, but the brush had blocked the message. He had simply taken a section forward to investigate the rifle fire. Oldenfield deployed his men into the British line, while the British Ascari held Lieutenant Oldenfield was immediately killed upon joining the action. The rest of his company wouldn't join the action that day, despite more messages being sent by Major James on the heliograph. At one moment, Captain Pottinger advanced to a hill north overlooking the German firing line, his entire company behind him, but by the time he summited the crest of the hill, he had about 10 men with him. The rest of his men were struggling to follow in the African bush. Pottinger ordered number 4050 Nik Gul Mohammed to lead the rest of the company to the crest. As he fell back, he came upon Schultz's machine gunners. In a mad minute, he silenced the German machine gun. As he fell back to reload, Mohammed found Subdihar Sherbaz with a section. The pair made their way back just as the Germans attempted to bring back to action the silenced machine gun. Mohammed was wounded by the returning German fire. As Subduhar Sherbaz attempted to drag the wounded Mohammed, a German bullet went through Subduhar's head, and it would take Pottinger's retreat to pick up the wounded Mohammed. By this time, the Germans had occupied the hill Pottinger had taken. As Pottinger redeployed his men, Lieutenant Phillips' King's African Rifles moved forward to engage the German line. Now that the combined weight of Pottinger and Phillips' men were firing on the Germans, the Germans hastily abandoned their position. Skinner, seeing the German forces flee, takes the heights with what men he had. The rest of the action is small firefights throughout the rest of the African bush. Despite the Germans falling back and the British halting, the 6th and 7th of September is full of small firefights. While Major James did the best his training allowed to surround the enemy column, the African bush threatened him. The British heliograph messages to the north at Imtito Andi hadn't been seen due to the thick African bush. The forces from the south 
at Bra and Maktau didn't arrive till the 7th at Tembo. There, outside Tembo, the King's African Rifles Infantry managed to capture one of the many German ambulance parties. While the mounted infantry detachment surrounded and shot up a different German ambulance party. Despite the non-combatant nature of the German doctors, this was hidden by the African bush and the surgeons and the stretcher bearers were cut down. When this was discovered, an apology was sent from Nairobi and issued to the German capital at Dar es Salaam. But the majority of the day was spent by the Germans withdrawing back to the border, while the British were spent rallying their men and mop-up operations. German exact losses are unrecorded. Schultz simply records his casualties as light. British casualties in the first Indian engagement of East Africa was two officers and 18 other ranks. With the success of the action on the Enzima River, Major James took stock of what had worked. Lieutenant Hardingham, with 24 Ascaris, had stalled a column of 200-plus Germans from his camp at Campia Marabu. To combat the African bush, additional outposts were being established to slow any advance aimed at the Tesevo Railroad Bridge. Notably, two separate spots in the Enzima Springs area, one at Tembo and another at the river junction near the Nol Torush. But the course of this video will focus on the original outpost at Kampia Marabu. The camp was reoccupied by the British on the 11th of September, this time though garrisoned by men of a larger mixed force of the 4th King's African Rifles and Somali Scouts. The outpost was under both Lieutenant Foster of the A Company, 4th King's African Rifles, and Captain Isaacson of the East African Regiment. The Somali Scouts section of the East African Regiment will be noted in many sources as Cole Scouts, of which Isaacson was second in command. The sources aren't clear if these Somalis were infantry or mounted troops. The various kraals were used to house the various mules used for mounts and baggage. The Somalis were used as pickets and patrols, while the British Askaris used to garrison the two of the three kraals and a bivouac camp. And for over a week, things were quiet. Captain Schultz, after having been beaten back on the 6th of September, was ordered by Vorbrick on the 13th of September to make another attempt. No additional reinforcements were sent, and Vorbrick doesn't seem to have been aware of the casualties and the tactics. His only concern was that another attempt be made by 13th Feld Company on the Tesebo River Bridge. At this time, Schultz had around 100 men. 5.30 a.m. on the 19th of September, his column once again closed on the Kempiya Marabu. The Somali pickets caused Schultz's column to once again go from column into line. In this time, the British Somali pickets were able to retire to the British Askari camp and raise the alarm. The leadership at the British camp ordered it struck and the mules with the baggage sent north over the old Tortoise River. As the British attempted to fall back and prepared to send a runner to Tesevo, Schultz ordered his men forward, cutting off some of the King's African rifles. Seven British mules were shot and killed before they could cross the river, and Lieutenant Foster was mortally wounded at this time. Meanwhile, the encamped Somalis moved south and recovered the baggage mules and secured the baggage of the felled mules. Now, the two British forces were able to work over the Germans. Suffering Isaacson's counterattack, Schultz ordered a withdrawal. After two hours of combat, the Germans were once again falling back to Hemo. Schultz again doesn't record any casualties, but the British were able to find 11 dead Ascaris and 6 wounded left on the field. But there could possibly have been more. British losses were 1 officer and 6 dead British Ascaris. Captain Isaacson recommends the British abandon the position. The men under his command would be better at Frost's Castle and Kichua Tembo Forts. Two days later, on the 21st of September, they were given leave to withdraw. A company of the King's African Rifles were withdrawn by rail while the Somali scouts were sent to Frost's castle. Meanwhile, Schultz's men would be made once again to assault the Tesebo River Bridge, and the third time would be the charm. Just past the Enzima River Junction, Captain A.C.D. Saunders of the King's African Rifles establishes a base of sorts to slow any advance up the river features to attack the Tesevo Railroad Bridge. The site had been chosen by H.E. Frost, an intelligence department officer who had identified this position and related to Major A.A. A. James. Named Frost's Castle, was positioned on high ground overlooking the local bush and the crisscross river waves. Not only that, but the river crossings approaches to the north and west were mudflats, difficult and slow to cross. 
in the area two separate German attacks had been made and been driven back, or slowed at a more forward position. But now Frost's castle was the most forward position. If a German attack on the Tesevo Bridge was made, the Germans from any direction would have to cross here. Captain Saunders' force included B Company of the 4th King's African Rifles and Captain Isaacson's Somali Scouts, six officers, 215 men, and two machine guns. Despite having been beaten by the British twice, Vorbrick ordered Hauptmann Schultz to occupy the Nyulu Hills. Vorbrick's command staff member, Whale, worried that with heavy German losses, attempts to inflict an attack on the Tesevo River Bridge area, that the German Ascaris would be less effective or simply surrender, and further offensive operations were a mistake. It would take Vorbrick longer to see this wisdom, and Schultz's battered troops were reinforced by 4th Feld Company under Hauptmann Rothert. On the night of the 25th of September, Schultz's column's scouts exchanged fire with the British pickets. Captain Saunders hurried to move the last section of British Ascaris and their machine gun into Frost's castle. The next day, the 26th of September, the Germans advanced in line onto Frost's castle. Saunders only reached and deployed the last of his men an hour before the German machine guns began peppering the newly dug British trenches. For the entire day, machine guns roared and the German line attempted to assault the British at various angles. The thorn bushes to the south prevented the Germans from bypassing Frost's castle, and when they emerged from cover, they were immediately fired upon by the British Ascari riflemen. When the German machine guns would find a position and begin firing, the two British machine guns would silence the four German machine guns. As the sun reached its climax, so did the battle, the Germans having suffered losses and unable to find an assault position to charge the British, decided early in the afternoon to retire from combat. To Captain Saunders, it was strange the Germans retired without a general assault. So for the night of the 26th until the 27th of September, the British manned their positions. Only after daylight broke did Saunders send reconnaissance forward. The reconnaissance reported the Germans had retired, but not only that, retreated back to Hemo. Unknown to the British, Hauptmann Schultz had been wounded, so had seven other German Ascaris. German losses were higher, but the Germans left their dead behind, and Saunders didn't record how many were buried that day. The British losses were too wounded. The Germans also abandoned their machine guns and a satchel of German army intelligence. Schultz wouldn't heal and return to duty until 1916. With the offensive commander bedridden, offensive operations wouldn't resume towards Tesevo. The German colonists and Schutzen companies assigned to the area didn't independently attempt to attack the Tesevo bridge. Only after Schultz had been wounded was Vorbrick informed of all the difficulties of the operations that took place. Hauptmann Rothert said the terrain was too difficult and the British defenders too numerous. Hauptmann Rothert refused Vorbrick's orders to make another assault on the 2nd of October. Thus, operations ceased for a time in the Tesevo region. The local British Maasai tribesmen resumed cooperation with the British, offering scouts and bearers. These minor victories were also good press in the papers, boosting British morale.